Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this webinar. What are they working on? What are the new topics that will be published? Can I join any of the groups? Are they looking for industry, academic experts? These are the different types of questions that will be answered to this webinar called entitled ILSE Europe, Emerging Research Proposals and Call for Interest. My name is Isabel Hulling, and I'm a scientific director at ILSE Europe. And I'm sharing this webinar together with Kian. Hi, um, my name is uh, Kieran Tui. I'm a professor of our energy metabolism and microbiome at the School of Food Biosciences and Nutrition at the University of Leeds in the UK. And I'll be helping Isabel to chair the session and deal with some questions afterwards. Yeah. We have a very vibrating and dynamic program prepared for today. So there will be short presentations, presenting a research proposal that you can ask questions on, that you can express your interest for, um, and don't hesitate to comment in the chat. So the first present the first uh, start will be an introduction to ILCU for those who don't know it yet. And then we'll kick off with Jonathan Lane, who will present an activity entitled Microbiome-Based Research Before and During Pregnancy following by Anerik uh, talking about cognitive performance, the gut microbiota, and the role of prebiotics. Following then, uh, following in the same field of biotics, but then on postbiotics, so gathering consumer insights and knowledge gaps. To then go over to Andrea, who will discuss a research proposal regarding biological assessment, questioning how old are you really, or is your gut saying something else? And then we'll stop there to again go to a live Q&A uh, session with all the presenters. And then on the second session, uh, Professor Ellen Black from uh, Maastricht will give a presentation on precision nutrition to improve blood glucose homeostasis, followed by Sophie Vinoy on carbohydrate and protein intake interaction during aging. And finally, Jose uh, Ordovas. Um, from Tufts University will present on multiple phases of personalized precision nutrition. We'll then mm -hmm. have a live question and answer session. Yeah, indeed. And don't keep your question until the end. While the people are presenting, don't hesitate to put the, the questions in the Q&A chat, and then we'll prepare the sessions, the questions as they go. But before starting with all this research, interesting research, let me give you a short introduction to ILSI Europe. Our vision is to secure food supply for all and is respectful of our planet. We want to be a credible and trusted source of science and science to support the supervision of safe, healthy and sustainable food. And everything that we do in our mission is based on this tripartite model, where we convey experts from academia, industry, and the government. We never do science for one company only, but it always for at least five companies. So we work on pre-competitive topics in the field. And an example of how this comes around, I will give in a minute, but here to show all the members that are currently within ILC Europe's network. And of course we wel welcome uh, new members in the sector of food ingredients, food, uh, food producers, but it can also be retailers, pharmacological uh, companies or cosmetic companies are also in our, in our portfolio. So how does collaboration look like? They sit together in a task force and I, here I give you the example of the prebiotics task force where you see multiple companies uh, supported by academic experts, and we also have in several task force and public organization. Every task force has a clear objective in which they develop research activities. It's a task force initiating these activities, like you will see today, and then after a review by external independent uh, reviewers, checking the conduct, the integrity principles, ensuring that the right people are in, in, in the activity, um, it's handed over to an expert group, and an expert group contains at least 50% of academic experts supported with expertise coming from industry and the public sector. On the right hand side of the slide, you can see our portfolio of current task forces. Today, they will be focusing mainly on the nutrition task forces, and several of them, like early nutrition, long term health, 
the health benefit assessment of food and also the pre and probiotics have will pitch some of their new activities in this webinar. If you ask members on why is it so relevant to join these activities, they will definitely list some of these. The first one is the network. So you don't only network with your peers in a task force, but through ILSI, you can also be part of European funded projects. And there the network is just huge. We are also at ILSI Europe, an official EFSA stakeholder. So we also communicate through a digital platform with EFSA and explain explain our activities and hear what their priorities are. ILC Europe is the European branch, but we also have branches across the world, as you can see here on the screen. If necessary, if a an topic needs a global approach, we reach out to our entities to collaborate. So today we will also have a research proposal coming from actually ILC US and the Canada program. A second benefit is, of course, the high quality science. When you're in a task force, you kept up to date with the scientific evol uh, progress. You're conducting research yourself, uh, and this goes always into peer reviewed publications. Our aim is to publish in Q1 uh, papers. Besides the papers that you can see here on the screen, we also develop monographs or teaching materials, which lay out the bas basic principles of uh, some of the topics and here I give you the example of the pre and the probiotics. This monograph has been translated in six languages, so I'm sure that you will find one of interest to you. And then the third uh, benefit is of course the communication and dissemination. Within ILSI, we have one voice and communicate the same um, knowledge or consensus. Uh, we do this at either existing conferences like you see on the screen, we were present at the Microbiome and Probiotics R&D Business Collaboration in the beginning of the spring this year. We we're also very active in IPC. Beneficial Microbes was just a, um, a few weeks ago. And for next year, I invite you already to mark your agenda for the fans next year. We'll have uh, four sessions already in the program. And we also have our annual symposium on the 24th of October. So it is why people are joining ILC Europe. Um, more information you can find, of course, on our website. Um, all the recording of what you will be hearing today will be there as well on, on the website. You can, of course, don't hesitate to contact me directly and follow us on, on Twitter. And with this short introduction, I go over to the science. Is This is why we joined. So now we'll go back to the program and I'll announce the, the first speaker, which will be Jonathan Lane, who is Associate Tech Director of the Research and Innovation at the Health and Happiness Group. He is a global leader in the premium nutrition and wellness for all life uh, ages. And prior joining to h, &H Jonathan was an infant nutrition program manager for Food and, and Health Ireland. Um, he was also a research officer at Tagates Food Research Central in Moor Park. Uh, and he completed his PhD in glycobiology at the Tagates uh, through the University College of Dublin. Um, I go over to now the presentation of uh, Jonathan. Hi, my name is Jonathan Lane, and I'm Associate Director of Research and Innovation for the Health and Happiness Group. And I'm going to introduce to you today a new activity for LC Europe that we've entitled Microbiome-Based Research Before and During Pregnancy. And this activity is supported by the Probiotic Task Force within LC Europe. The use of probiotics during pregnancy is not an established procedure yet. And given the importance of early life microbiota development and the fact that this development starts at or even before birth, it is crucial to better understand the microbiota changes, natural or induced, during pregnancy. And at this moment in time, there is clearly a lack of evidence for microbiota changes during pregnancy and we do see some conflict with regard to scientific publication. We have a Cochrane review which highlights the risks associated with probiotic supplementation during pregnancy and ISAP in their blog releasing a position where more studies are required. So our research activity aims to understand the impact of natural microbiota changes during pregnancy, to support for precision administration of specific probiotic strains, to steer microbiota changes in a desired direction. We aim to give insight into the importance of the microbiota as an inducer of a healthy pregnancy 
as well as a potential cause of pregnancy related health issues. To examine natural changes in the gut, vagina and endometrium microbiota of a pregnant mother. To look at mechanistic consequences of the observed changes and early observations from clinical studies with probiotics. So our approach is the first, create an inventory of microbiome signatures from cohort data. Then create an inventory of mechanistic consequences of microbiome changes. And then create an inventory of early observations from clinical studies. This will be then packaged and discussed with an expert panel after which we will then look at personalized precision probiotic supplementation leading to a perspective review. In terms of timeline, we aim to finalize the proposal by the end of this year, kick off the activity in Q1 next year, and then the expected finalization is early 2024. And the expected impact of this activity is to inspire product innovation and provide mechanistic support for existing products, to give guidance to healthcare professionals in this multidisciplinary field, to provide clarification on potential mechanisms of action and also guide future research, and provide an overview of available science for easy benchmarking. So thank you for your time. And I hope I've provided you with some inspiration with regard joining the ILSI Europe Probiotic Task Force. Thank you. This was a short presentation of Jonathan, and now we'll be moving to Anne-Rique, who will present on cognitive performance, gut microbiome, and the role of prebiotics. Don't hesitate to put your questions in the Q&A. And uh, while we're waiting for the next presentation, um, it's all about uh, a call for interest. So if you have thoughts or you want to join this activity, don't hesitate to post that as well. So over now to the presentation of Anelik. Hello, everyone. I am Anelik Chakraborty. I'm a senior scientist at Cargill. Welcome to the webinar. Here, I am going to talk to you about an activity on cognitive performance, gut microbiome, and prebiotics. I'm chairing the Prebiotics Task Force, and in collaboration with many other experts, we are embarking on this activity. If you think about the area of cognition, cognition as a whole will be thought about comprising the mental processes of attending to, understanding of, remembering and utilizing information. These processes can be influenced by genetics, environmental and lifestyle factors, including nutrition. In fact, recent evidence suggests that prebiotics have the potential to influence cognitive functioning. Some studies have shown that this could be via the microbiota gut-brain axis, for example, by modulating the microbiota composition, the function, resulting in signal transduction via nervous, endocrine, and immune pathways to the brain and central nervous system. Prebiotics may also influence the cognitive functioning via microbiota-independent pathways. However, these aspects have been less extensively studied. If you think about the preclinical evidence, they do point towards a procognitive and neuroprotective effect of prebiotics as well ranging from positively impacting neurological function to behavioral alterations. However, when it comes to humans, investigating the effects of prebiotics on cognition is still in the early stages. There are some studies involving healthy, elderly, as well as individuals with disease states. However, several aspects of the studies conducted so far, for example, the study design, short duration of the studies, clinical heterogeneity of the population, heterogeneity of the cognitive tests being used amongst others, impacts what translatable conclusions we can draw out of these. So that brings us to the point, how can we utilize all of this information to guide further investigations in the field of prebiotics and its role in cognition? This is where this activity looks towards identifying the most promising cognitive domains 
of prebiotic intervention, talking about the methods and other instruments that could be applied to evaluate and substantiate the impact of prebiotics on cognition, the gaps in the study design and the methodologies with a focus on prebiotics on rescuing cognitive functioning, and ultimately the methodological recommendations to test the rescuing effects of prebiotics on impaired cognition. To do this, our approach is that we will review the state of the evidence and summarize potential mechanisms of action, identify the most promising cognitive domains, and provide an overview of the methods and instruments which are used in this field, identifying gaps and provide recommendations. All of this will be summarized in a perspective review, highlighting ultimately the need to perform further clinical studies in healthy participants that can test the rescuing effects of prebiotics. If you think about the timeline, we are at the phase of proposal development. We hope to kick off this activity in quarter one of 2023 with the aim of finalizing it by quarter one 2024. In terms of an impact, we believe that the outcomes of this activity will allow us to develop a consensus understanding of the evidence connecting prebiotics to cognition and mental health to inspire product innovations, to guide and further knowledge on prebiotics as suitable constituents in the diets to improve health, to pave the ground for new funded R&D projects, example on the EU level, and to build up consensus results on translatability and applicability of preclinical results and the strategies that have been used. With that, I thank you for your attention and look forward to any questions that you may have to myself or to the expert group or to ILSI Prebiotics Task Force. Thank you once again. Thank you very much, Anirik, for this presentation. And I'm very thrilled to see all of these activities. And I see questions coming in, so please keep them coming. While I announce our third speaker, which is Delphine Solier, who is the head science lead at Novozyme One Health. Uh, Delphine is a health science lead in the Productive Health Venture at Novozyme One Health. She received her PhD in microbiology on probiotic and prebiotics in 2007 from the University of Reading in the UK. And afterwards working as a postdoc and microarray core laboratory director at the uh, Texas Children's Hospital in Houston. There she gained a profound understanding of the mode of action of well-known beneficial microbes and characterizing the microbiome in different GI conditions in human and preclinical -pre models. And now she will be talking about uh, postbiotics and a consumer insights and knowledge gap. And I'm really curious to hear more about this activity and especially seeing it, seeing it kick up, kicked off. Over to um, Delphine's presentation. Good afternoon. This is Delphine Sonier from Novozymes. Today, I would like to present you a new activity that we are performing together with uh, ILC Europe as part of the Probiotic Task Force. This is an activity we are putting together with Gabriella Gross from Rekit, Richard Day from ADM, and Isabel Gelling from ILC Europe. The name of this new activity is Postbiotics, Consumer Understanding and Gap Analysis. So a little bit of background. In the last years, we have seen uh, the emergence of your new term for a new class of biological solution, which is postbiotics. If you wonder what they are, so by scientists, they are defined as preparation of inanimate microorganisms and or their components that confers a health benefit to the host. However, there are still some discussion among scientists already for these definitions. And at this stage is still for us unknown what the consumers uh, is thinking about this concept, whether they first understand it and whether they will find it attractive. So that's why we are putting together these activities and here are the objectives. 
So first, we would like to identify the proportion of consumers who are aware of postbiotic. Then we would like to seek to understand from a consumer perspective, what are the gaps, what is missing around postbiotics and about the concept. And last but not least, the ultimate aim of this work is really to provide guidance for consumers, but also for healthcare practitioners on the health benefit of these postbiotics, and also try to give some guidance for scientists on which gap uh, there is still to be addressed. Here is our approach. So first, for this activity, we will start with a cross-sectional survey, a large one uh, among adults across different countries. So we will target approximately 2,000 uh, consumers across different continents. So of course, we will target Europe and different countries. We would like also to try to have an answer about the, U the US, so North America, and also hopefully Asia, so for instance, uh, with China. So once we get the answer from this service, we will perform a deep analysis. There we will also invite uh, experts uh, to really dig into these differences between countries and how postbiotics are really perceived. Then with this expert, we will identify the gaps uh, that are remaining and communicate. So really, ultimately, we want to try to provide guidance around the communication for postbiotics to both consumers and healthcare practitioners. So that could be, for instance, a publication or the way of disseminating seminars and reaching out really to this uh, different audience. So this is our timeline. So the proposal is being developed currently, and we will continue to finalize until the first quarter of next year. Then we will have the activity kickoff in the second quarter of next year. And then this activity will be finalized after we collect the survey, have time to really dig into the, the result with experts and provide guidance at the end of 2024. Thank so you which impact that. do we expect about this activity? So first for the industry partners, it's really to try to get some insight about postbiotics and the consumer. What do they understand? What is attractive to them? How do they differentiate it uh, from probiotics? Then also we want to better understand and, and try to make some guidance for communication to the healthcare practitioners and also to the consumers what should they say about postbiotics, how to really pass the message uh, as well. Then last but not least, and also because it's an NIMSI activities, we really would like to address uh, to the scientists and tell them, also guide them where more research is needed in this field. So with this, I would like to Thank you for your attention. I would like to thank especially my partners for drafting this activity and this proposal, as well as the different members of the Probiotic Task Force. Their input has been so far very valuable as well. We are happy to answer any questions um, later today about these uh, activities. If you would like to participate as well, then please let us know. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Delphine. Uh, and indeed, everybody is welcome to state of interest and join. So keep the questions coming. If you have content questions on or on the way of working, we will answer them after this last presentation from the first part. And this will be Andrea Pertoco, Director of the Scientific Affairs at Herbalife Nutrition. As director within the scientific affairs, uh, 
Andrea is responsible for ensuring the safety and the scientific integrity of the products and the product related materials for the market in Europe, Middle East and Africa, with specific responsibility for ensuring that all products claims are scientifically substantiated and meet regulatory requirements within the EU, but also in other EMEA markets, of course. And today, Andrea will present to us um, a very particular title for the activities, and I'm very curious to see this executed. It's about biological age assessment. Are you as old as your gut says you are? So over to Andrea. Hi there. My name is Andrea Bertocco, Director of Scientific Affairs at Herbalife Nutrition. I'm also an ELC member and a member of the Health Benefits Assessment of Foods Task Force, along with Professor Brian Hanley and Professor Helen Svech. I'd like to talk to you about an interesting project, a project that involves measuring our biological age. When we think of aging, we all have in mind getting gray hair or wrinkles on our face or not being able to carry out tasks as we used to in the past. But the truth is that a lot more may be happening inside us. And to demonstrate this, we just came up with this nice cartoon saying that someone goes to the doctor and the doctor says, well, it appears that your gut microbiome is not as young as you think it is. So one of the ideas that we had with this project, it was to see whether or not our biological watch is out of sync with our chronological watch. This project focuses on three main building blocks. The first one focuses on understanding the differences between our biological and chronological clocks by focuses on the gut microbiome. Now the word gut microbiome may imply a lot of work and years of research, so we have to focus on one or two specific biomarkers. Are these metabolites? Are these differences in the gut microflora? Once we have understood it, we can move on to phase two. Phase two focuses on see how health, lifestyle or dietary changes can put these two clocks in sync. And the third one will focus on the benefits. How can we, once we have put our biological and chronological clocks in sync, achieve health benefits? And which one are those? And as for every big project, we need to start with baby steps. So at the beginning, we'd like to liaise and interact with experts in the field, within ILSI and outside of ILSI, to see whether or not we can identify two, maximum three, health-related aspects that will be part of this project. And this is done through a series of workshops. Once we've done it, we move on to the next phase. And on the next one, we will develop a tool, a tool that allows us to see what those changes are in our biological age. It's like taking a time lapse by focusing on specific aspects of the gut microbiome through interaction that are coming from our diet or our lifestyle. And this ends with a publication. So once we have this tool that takes our snapshot, then we can understand what those health benefits are. And this will be the focus of the final year, or the final two years of this project, whether we check whether or not we can sync the two clocks together, our chronological and our biological watch, and see whether or not we can achieve health benefits from doing so. We have quite an ambitious plan for this project, and our plan starts with workshops that will take place in Q1 and Q2 next year to identify those two or three health-related aspects. And then the project officially kicks off at the end of 2023. We think it will last between three to four years and probably will yield two to three publications. This is a great project and we think it has an impact on those three areas, public sector, industry and academia. As far as the public sector is concerned, 
This can be used as an educational tool for customers and key opinion leaders. So it's not just about what I was saying at the beginning of this presentation, having gray hair or uh, uh, wrinkles on our face. It is about understanding what other changes are taking place within our body. With regards to the industry, it is an opportunity to develop tools that can change health and behavior. And lastly, as far as the epidemia is concerned, this is really a way to cross pollinate, share ideas and even embark on brand new research. I truly hope I was able to give you an overview of this project. I hope you find it exciting, challenging and perhaps unique. I think this will be quite an endeavor, but with the right experts, we can follow that timeline. We can build those blocks and come up with quite an interesting project. A project that hopefully will deliver what it says and will lead us to educate, support the development of new products and as well yield a couple of interesting publications. Well, if you like it, then join us. We need experts in this field. We need your brainstorming activities. So get in touch with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea, also for this presentation and sharing your enthusiasm. We've come to the uh, first, the end or first part. So now we'll have a live Q&A. So I invite um, Andrea, Jonathan, Anerik, and Delphine to, to put on their cameras and, and join on audio. And um, we have a first content question, and it's a critical question, which is good because we need to be critical for ourselves to ensure that we don't duplicate science. So the first one comes from Brian Henley. The microbiome has become very popular. How much of this is really new and how much is really just a repackaging of previously failed probiotic initiatives? Is it important that there's a provable link between well characterized gut microbiomes and clinical endpoints? Is this the aim of the proposed work? And this question goes to Jonathan, but it can also be answered by other uh, experts who are presenting. Jonathan. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, the microbiome is popular, but, but for good reason. I, I've given a short response in, in the Q&A section. And that good reason is not only for probiotic clinical studies with, with health outcomes and, and benefits, but also because of the dynamic shift and the evolutionary profile associated with the microbiome. So if we deal with our proposal specifically, uh, probiotics in pregnancy or microbiome shift during pregnancy is an area that is essentially under discussed. And, um, you know, we actually do see some conflict as highlighted within the scientific community. So at LC Europe and the Probiotic Task Force, we're passionate about closing that gap, getting expert opinion, and ultimately highlighting potential interventions through precision uh, probiotic supplementation, and also the guidelines maybe for, for clinical trial design. Like, like you rightly said, we need to create a provable link Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Going to the second question, which is for Anirik. Is it also the intention to include neurological disorders like dementia and depression in the activity? Is there uh, a certain focus group like elderly population in the activity? That's a very fair question. Actually, we did debate about this quite a bit. Um, what, what the first point of the discussion was more or less like a consensus which was reached was that if you think about cognition and our initial definition and the scoping of this, we're talking about aspects like the memory systems, we're talking about aspects of perception, executive functions and things like this. So that is one part, identifying which would be, which would be the relevant areas of cognition that we could focus on. And then also what is it that we want to get at the end? Of it? At the end of the whole thing, we want to be able to make certain um, let's say provide guidance, make certain statements in terms of like, what is the consensus so far for a healthy population? So at the current moment, I would say that we were thinking more in terms of systematically examining specifically the rescuing effects of the prebiotics on impaired cognition. And this is what the three terms I mentioned in non-disease populations. 
And that doesn't mean that this is the end all. This is just a small scope to begin scoping this thing out and to see what is it that we could provide as a consensus output. Then there would be the definitely the other areas that like you mentioned as the next steps possibly, or even over here, if we do not find things enough in this particular subgroup that we're focusing on right now. Hope that helps with your question, Mark. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anri. Then there's a question for Andrea, uh, and it's as posed by Edwin. Will the measurements of microbiome age be based on specific diversity of functional diversity? Andrea. Thanks, Isabel. I'll also answer Mark's uh, uh, question, Mark uh, Heinrichs. Um, mm -hmm. we, we don't know that yet, so we, we plan to uh, get the workshop going. Um, brainstorm on uh, those uh, uh, ideas and then eventually uh, set the scene for uh, for the project. So these are really um, uh, early stages. We The project is at its infancy at the moment. So we haven't yet ironed out some of those aspects, but we, we think the idea is challenging and quite interesting. And the workshops will help us to basically iron out the path for this project and it will take place uh, over the next uh, six months in 2023. Mm -hmm. Indeed, it is also there are some questions in the Q&A about the execution. So as, uh, as Andrea said, these are projects which are still maturing and, uh, and some a little bit more advanced than others. So for this workshop, you can express your interest by just sending us an email and saying like, I have the expertise, I want to join. But indeed, you can still join to shape further this, these proposals. An expert group is set up um, based on the networks that we have, the publications who have been recently published. If you're an expert, you have a recent publication and we'll contact you as well following this. An expert group is, as I mentioned in the introduction, has at least 50% of academic experts. And then there's also expertise coming from industry and other uh, organizations if needed. So then I think there's um, more um, questions regarding Isabel? Yes. We have one for uh, Delphine from Collat Chart. Are the yes, regulatory aspects of the term postbiotic being considered in consumer project? Yeah, thank you, my co-chair. Delphine. Yes, could you please repeat, uh, Karen? Are the regulatory the aspects? Oh, sorry. There's a question for, from Colette Short on have the regulatory aspects of postbiotics been considered in this proposal? Would yes, that's a very them? good uh, question, Karen. Indeed, so we will uh, consider this, uh, this aspect in the second part of the, the proposal. So once we have uh, reached out to consumers and identified the gap, we will invite some experts. And as part of the expert, indeed, we are thinking of having this regulatory expert um, because we know that already from a probiotic perspective, the regulatory path is not always uh, clear and very dynamic, and we expect this will be the, the same for regulatory. So, yeah, this is being considered as well. And maybe for the last question that, that goes back to Jonathan, did you detect the ethical differences in the vaginal microbiome and it is it possible to change a vaginal microbiome depends on the season and what can be can be the contribution of the mother vaginal corrected microbiome in child's further gut microbiome? Yeah, not easy, not easy. Um, but look, some of these factors that are addressed and actually some of the other questions as well, um, such as shifting the microbiome and you know, breastfeeding, you know, I think might, that might be a li link to human milk oligosaccharides, for example, which now we know during pregnancy are systemic and probably driving microbiome shifts and probably contributing to, to infant development. I know there's a lot of research in, in this area, but um, I suppose in, in short as well, all of, we are maturing this uh, activity and all of these proposals, whether that's the mum's age, whether that's the, the other uh, genetic factors, dietary factors, et cetera, all of these will be looked at. All of them will then be looked to see in context consequences for the immune system, for example, for hormonal development expression, and then outcomes really in, in terms of microbiome shift leading to infant. 
Something that we're really passionate about as well is understanding the outcome for infants as well as mom, as well as for a healthy pregnancy. But we see this as a massive area and, and potentially a follow-up activity with the probiotic task force to look at infants in, in the not too distant future. But uh, it, it's a really hot topic and we're really passionate about it. Okay. Then for Madam Simon, please. I hand it over to my co-chair to announce the, the three upcoming presenters, and then we'll go over, uh, end with a, another q &A. Kieran, over to you. Okay, thanks, Isabel. So our next speaker is Professor Ellen Black from the University of Maastricht, where she is chair in the Department of Human Biology. She's an expert in energy metabolism, and especially how fatty acids and short-chain fatty acids uh, interact along the gut adipose tissue muscle access to impact on obesity and type 2 diabetes. She's been involved in the top Institute of Food Nutrition on several advisory boards and grant evaluation committees and has run more than 30 uh, research projects and supervised more than 30 PhD theses. And the title of the uh, presentation is Precision Nutrition to Improve um but to improve blood glucose levels dear audience it's my pleasure to present the ilse europe uh, activity on precision nutrition to prevent chronic metabolic diseases the prevalence of chronic metabolic diseases like obesity type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease increases worldwide lifestyle intervention based on general guidelines diet and physical activity may reverse or prevent uh, this and that's depicted in this slide. Here you see the European Diabetes Intervention Prevention Study, a study directed towards individuals with pre-diabetes. And lifestyle intervention uh, improves the cumulative survival free of type 2 diabetes in the intervention group in blue, in the blue line versus the control group, resulting in a cumulative incidence of diabetes and immutability syndrome, which is reduced by 57%. Looking more into detail at those data, we see that 30% of the individuals do not adhere or respond, and there's a large variability in response. It's increasingly evident that one size does not fit all. So uh, by personalizing uh, the lifestyle intervention towards someone's personal characteristics, we, we may improve adherence and effectiveness of intervention. And personalization may work, at least for glycemic responses. This has been shown in a landmark study uh, by Savi and co Workers. They measured personal features for 800 people related to microbiome, blood tests, questionnaires, anthropometrics, and food diary. They developed an algorithm based on that, designed personalized diets to lower glycemic responses, and tested that subsequently in daily life, and that seemed to work. Another approach is to define subgroups based on a population. Subgroups uh, distinguished uh, by metabolic phenotype and define for those different subgroups an optimal diet. That's an approach we also take in our research at Maastricht University. We focus on tissue-specific insulin resistance. Insulin resistance may be very important in response to, to diet. Insulin resistance may develop simultaneously in different tissues like adipose tissue, liver and muscle. But there is also a group of individuals with more pronounced liver insulin resistance or more pronounced muscle insulin resistance. And that's around one third of the overweight population. These phenotypes are characterized by different cardiovascular metabolic risk profile, but they also may require organ-specific interventions. So that's what we tested in the person study, where this was a precision nutrition randomized control trial of 12 weeks where diets were targeted according to tissue specific insulin resistant phenotypes. We showed that modulation of dietary macronutrient composition according to insulin resistant phenotype results in a pronounced clinically further of improvement in cardiometabolic risk markers independent of changes in body weight. So this is one of the first double blind randomized trials to provide indications that precision nutrition for metabolic subgroups may be superior to a diet based on general guidelines for improving cardiometabolic health. The background of the ILSI activity. We know that the challenges within the precision nutrition field are the lack of robust, robust and reproducible results, 
a thorough understanding why people respond differentially to diets, the translation into relevance for healthcare professionals, dietary guidelines, the high cost of detailed phenotyping, including omics methodologies, and in the implementation of precision nutrition, ethical and regulatory aspects. The objective of our activity is that we, in a systematic narrative review, we will address the definition of precision nutrition and the different approaches, the importance of omics methodologies within the context of a holistic approach, uh, a discussion on what approach should we take, data-driven versus more, a more knowledge-based approach or combination, the future perspective related to translation into prevention practice, uh, self-management of individuals, uh, dietary guidelines, and the regulatory and ethical aspects. We expect to summarize existing knowledge in a systematic narrative review and to uh, increase insight and discussion in the field of precision nutrition. This is the timeline, uh, proposal development in the second quarter of 2023, activity kickoff the second uh, or the third uh, quarter of 2023, and the expected finalization in the second quarter of 2025. We expect to provide a knowledge-based overview of the precision nutrition approaches and perspectives, how to translate these into subgroups or individualized dietary guidelines, more leads and knowledge-based how to effectively implement precision nutrition approaches, and provide the underpinning science for the formulation of products, food products directed towards specific subpopulations. I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Ellen. Uh, our next speaker is Sophie Vinoy from Mendeley's International R&D, where she's Nutrition Research Senior Expert. Um, and her interests are in the impact of, of food on postprandial metabolism linked to metabolic disease prevention involving food behavior, low-grade inflammation, and microbiota modulation. So the title of her pitch today is Carbohydrate and Protein Intake Interaction During Aging. Thank you very much uh, to give me the opportunity uh, to share this new proposal um, uh, on behalf of the Carbohydrate Task Force. Um, and I wanted to thank as well Stefan Tess, Jose Maria Lopez, and Ellen Black uh, for, uh, to, have, uh, participate, to have participated to the um, elaboration of this new activity proposal. The background of, uh, sorry, my computer is stuck. Okay, the background of uh, this activity is, uh, first, we eat foods and not single macronutrients separately. And we know as well that there is a strong connections between carbohydrates and proteins metabolic, metabolic pathways. In addition to that, uh, there is an increased interest in maximizing the efficacy of dietary proteins with enhancing the nutritional value of more sustainable plant-based diets. So, uh, and there is a lot of science evaluating the role of different types of carbohydrates on carbohydrates metabolism or more widely postprandial metabolism. And it's the same for proteins. There is a, a lot of data uh, uh, evaluating the role of dietary proteins on postprandial metabolism and especially uh, protein synthesis, muscle mass, and uh, all these aspects. But the objective of this review of this work is to combine both uh, part of the uh, postprandial story. The idea is to review and publish evidence on uh, evaluate the influence of and types of carbohydrates on co-ingested with proteins on postprandial metabolism at short and long term. So the originality of the work is to put uh, all together on the same review, the effect of proteins on carbohydrate metabolism, and uh, we will uh, focus on the, on the uh, to, to be uh, more, uh, to have a more uh, well-designed uh, review on mainly on blood glucose homeostasis. And in the other hand, we will evaluate the carbohydrates on muscle mass uh, uh, protein synthesis and breakdown on muscle mass, sorry, 
which means that altogether uh, we will uh, provide recommendations uh, to combine both of them. And the idea is to put a narrative review, which uh, will be uh, supported by structure systematic literature search processes. We will use it this way for, the, uh, for this review to allow us to bring additional uh, papers or um, data, especially on the mechanistic approach, if we can. And the idea will be to focus on uh, gathering evidence on, uh, from intervention trials, mainly in adults and especially in, other, in older adults, when the functions start to be uh, less efficient. The work will be uh, based on three on, on two parts, and uh, you have understood maybe already that one part will be to uh, evaluate the relationship between protein types and sources on the metabolic fate on, of available carbohydrates. And the second part will be not exactly the opposite, but that is the complementary approach, which is the relationship between carbohydrate types and sources on the utilization of proteins uh, in relation to the postprandial events on longer term outcomes uh, to have at the end a conclusion on both aspects. The timeline of uh, the, this ambitious timeline is uh, we, the proposal development is done and validated. We are uh, building the expert group. So uh, welcome if uh, some uh, experts in this domain uh, would like to join this expert group. Uh, the kickoff will be in Q1 2023, and we expect uh, the, final, uh, the finalization of the work in Q4 2024. The expected impact is a robust guidance for maintaining muscle mass in adults and especially older population. Uh, on raising the efficacy of protein utilization in plant-based diets. We, want, we would like as well uh, to provide recommendation in formulation of products to optimize the nutritional efficacy of available carbs and proteins, because as uh, at the background, we eat proteins and carbs very often at the same time. And in ad additionally, we potentially think that they will need uh, more research in this area to address this combined metabolic fate. And we can even dream in several, in few years time, to combine protein, carbs, and lipids. So thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. And our last speaker is Professor uh, Jose Ordovez uh, from Tufts University. And he's a senior scientist in nutrition and genomics. Um, he's one of the founders of Nutrigenomics, and he's a strong interest in studying how diet interacts with genetic factors to impact on uh, cardiovascular disease risk, obesity, and chronobiology. Okay. Hello. It is my privilege to present on behalf of the group the charter that we have been uh, developing on the multiple phases of personalized or precision nutrition. For simplification purposes, uh, let's call it precision nutrition from uh, now on. Uh, what is the context for this initiative? Uh, well, first, let's look at the problem. Uh, and that is clearly shown in the graphics that we have above. It is the inter-individual heterogeneity in response to diet, uh, to food. And in this case, we have data in terms of uh, weight loss for uh, the diet fit study. And on the other uh, figure, we have the uh, heterogeneity in response to a standardized meal for triglycerides uh, in the postprandial state in the predicted study. Uh, those are just two examples. Uh, this applies to any intervention, whether it's dietary, behavioral, pharmacological, and this fact, this reality, uh, has had serious consequences in many regards, including the credibility and efficacy of uh, dietary recommendations or pharmacological therapies. What is the solution? Well, uh, we started to work in the so-called uh, solution back in the late 80s. 
and that was the birth of nutritional uh, genetics, nutritional genomics, and the seed of today's uh, precision nutrition. The path of this research has been tortuous, slow. Nevertheless, nevertheless the evidence became strong enough for Dr. Rogers and Dr. Collins uh, from NIH to publish in JAMA in 2020 uh, this uh, impactful viewpoint. Uh, precision nutrition is the answer to what to uh, eat to stay healthy. However, for this uh, bold statement to become a reality, precision nutrition must provide scientifically sound, practical and clinical relevant uh, solutions to alleviate the current health crisis that currently involves uh, both chronic and infectious diseases. Uh, it has to elicit the interest of uh, multiple sectors, it needs measurable outcomes, and it needs validation in different landscapes and applications in clinical settings. So, based on these premises, we elaborated some key practical and highly relevant objectives. First, to propose a standardized terms definitions um, for personalized and precision nutrition. To develop a theoretical framework with principles for evaluating the science and applying the evidence to create uh, and market personalized precision products and services. To identify the research needed to bring the science to its solid application in business and healthcare practice. To identify the best research practices for benefits and risks associated with precision nutrition. Moreover, we need to create educational materials for diverse groups of stakeholders related to genetics and other omics, as well as artificial intelligence and machine learning. To accomplish these objectives, we need to begin with a series of activities, including publications, scoping uh, systematic reviews, viewpoints, position statements, a website with content for all the stakeholders, and also to organize workshops or sessions at annual regional meetings where we can work and elaborate some of the activities indicated above. What ILSI brings to the table? ILSI will bring a better and comprehensive understanding of the value of precision nutrition approaches to the nutrition care process and identifying patterns and promising directions pertinent to all stakeholders. ILSI will have an impact on determining the current state of science, the identification of future research needs, facilitating input to funding agencies, and also the best practices, principles, guidelines for the application of precision nutrition. It's very important to consider that ILSI is global in geography and global in stakeholders. There are no international programs in precision nutrition, and this places ILSI in a pivotal position to answer the question of what to eat to stay healthy for everybody one at a time. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Jose. I think we've got a few minutes left to have uh, the question and answer session. I see we have some quite general questions that I might get away with, get out the way quickly. Uh, how can I join a project? Well, the best way would be to contact ILSI and state your interest in a particular activity. Um, are the, in the topics set? Is there room to broaden them? In general, the, the, the title or, or grand scope of the activities are set, but there is a lot of room within the activities to broaden um, depending on, on where, the, where the discussions go between the experts. Can students take part? Normally, normally the uh, expert panels are made up of, of experts, but often students take part as rapporteurs, for example, or to help with specific activities often brought by, by senior uh, academics. And then we have a specific question for Ellen. Um, will she apply 
uh, microbi uh, metagenomics and metabolomics to her studies? Yes, uh, if that relates to research activity uh, of ILU, ILSI, where we uh, will make the overview, of course, uh, there are important indications that microbiome and baseline microbial composition may be an important determinant of outcome, that there is an important interaction also between microbiome and, uh, and metabolome, uh, uh, so for, for sure, yeah. And also the data I presented from Maastricht, the precision nutrition intervention, indeed, there also we take into account microbial metabolome interactions, if that answers the question. Yeah, I think that's fine, Ellen. Thank you. And for Sophie, we've got a question on sources of carbohydrates and proteins from plants uh, or meat or other alternatives, and will they be compared within the project? Uh we will focus uh, for the proteins uh, the idea is to focus on the plant-based proteins but of course we'll have to compare them and their efficacy uh, with other ones so uh, we will use the full corpus of uh, the science at least in the plan and then uh, give recommendations uh, for the plant-based uh, the focus will be on plant-based for the recommendation at the end and for the carbohydrates it will be available carbs okay Thank you very much. Uh, and we've got another question for uh, Professor um, Ardoves from Brian Hadley. Uh, Brian says, precision personalized nutrition is usually challenging and uh, with an ideal cohort size that might be very restrictive on doing these studies. Do you expect individual dietary interventions for, for uh, a large population? Would, not, would this not be economically uh, impossible or challenging? Well, thank you, Brian. I entirely agree with you that uh, we have in our hands a huge challenge. Uh, however, uh, we have the uh, we have the understanding that we are going after something that is real. And uh, you have seen, and everybody has seen, those inter-individual variabilities in response to the same challenge, to the same diet. So this is real, and uh, we want to make sure that when we give dietary recommendations, the dietary recommendations are going to benefit the individual, not just the mean of the population. So in terms of how to approach this, there are there is not a single answer. We have to approach it from different perspectives. In the case of the US currently, we are embarked in what we have called the Nutrition for Precision Health initiative. And that will last, uh, that will take five years and will involve 15,000 people. And these people will be challenged in order to understand better the postprandial response, because that's where more of the action is going to take place to detect the uh, heterogeneity, individual heterogeneity in response, and also to different diets, diets that are contrasting. So we can see who responds well to one or another and so on. Uh, so that is, uh, that is the current a state of affairs in terms of precision nutrition research in the US, but it's important to understand that this will take only, it will take us only half of the way, because that will be, this project is designed to identify in a totally discovery fashion, no hypothesis, uh, to, uh, to develop prediction algorithms combining the responses of the individuals with artificial intelligence, right? Uh, so then it will come the next phase, which is, okay, we have detected, or we have, according to these algorithms, we can place individuals in different metabolic uh, tribes, right? Now we are going to see if these algorithms really work, and that's when the intervention uh, on populations will take place. And because you are starting with a more selected population, then we probably we will not need tens of thousands. We can do it with the numbers that we are used in our studies. It could be hundreds, it could be a few thousands. And yes, they are economically uh, costly. But uh, when we think what we are trying to accomplish and what we can save in terms of uh, personal pain and social cost, I think it will be worthwhile. And that will be. A, accomplished through a combination of uh, uh, public funding and also obviously 
uh, those stakeholders in terms of companies that will see the potential, and there are many, of developing uh, products, of developing diagnosis text, and so on. So that that is something that will be happening. Okay, but thank you very much. And I think you've addressed the, the next question was, um, will you uh, have an interest in basic research tools and methodologies needed to translate this uh, precision nutrition? So I think you covered th that as well as, as yeah. part of that answer. And again, we need every we need of everybody because of the complexity raised uh, uh, in relation to precision nutrition. We need different uh, expertises in terms of science, and on the other side the people that are going to translate that to reach the population, the public, the individual. Okay, thank you very much. And, and to finish off, because we're, we're tight on time, I've got a question for Isabel. Um, precision nutrition is, uh, is a topic for the European Union and European Partnership on Food Systems how, and, and some of the other activities mentioned as well today. How do you see these ILSI activities fitting into the broader European research effort? I don't know particularly the European partnership the person uh, Marcus is, is covering about, but indeed we do with ILSI aim to fill in and complement the research agenda of the commission, either through our own activities through task forces, either through consortia, uh, which we then submit for funding for Horizon Europe or under funding systems. So indeed, uh, we do hope that all these activities feed into the agenda of well of European uh, of European uh, needs and transforming the whole food system, of course. Okay. And I think yeah, we, we see that there's much interest coming in. So um, Christina will join the activity. So thank you very much. Where we went a little bit over time, so I really appreciate that you stayed. Um, uh, and with this, uh, I would like to thank also our speakers, not only for drafting such inspiring and an interesting and relevant research activities, but also for mastering the technology. So thank you for that. Um, if there remain questions unanswered, I will show again my email, but it's also in the chat. So don't hesitate to share, um, to, to email me if you have questions, if you want to join or if you want to join an expert group, that is all, always possible to help us shape further these activities. Kieran, as co-chair, would you like to say a final word before we close? Uh, because we are really running over time. Yeah. Okay, I'd just like to um, thank, thank the speakers for taking the time and energy to put these presentations together. I wish them the very luck, best of luck in their activities and to thank you, Isabel and Ilse for, for hosting this uh, webinar. Together also with Global Engage. So thank you to Camille for the organization and to Global Engage uh, for setting this up together with us. And with this, we wish you a good, a good, uh, good evening all to all and hope to hear you or see you in one of our activities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.